Hey, Pro-Life Jen. Thanks so much for subscribing to my Explicitly Pro-Life podcast this year. I'm so excited in 2023 to be bringing dozens of new guests and experts to you to give you all the marching orders you need to fulfill your mission to abolish abortion in our lifetime. But to finish off this year, we're going to replay the top three performing episodes of 2022, just in case you might have missed a week or two. Hope you enjoy. This is it, Pro-Life Jen. This is the moment we've been preparing for, the moment we've been training for on college campuses and communities across the country. This is it. This is our moment to transform from the pro-life generation to the first post-row generation. It's epic. All right, everyone, this is Kristen Hawkins. Welcome to this special episode of Explicitly Pro-Life Podcast. I'm going to break down what's happening right now in Washington, D.C., and how you can rebut uh, the talking points, um, the scare tactics of the abortion left that, that are, they're spouting right now on TV and on social media. First thing you need to know, last night, uh, Politico reported that uh, the Supreme Court was set to reverse Roe versus Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood, a draft of the, the majority decision decision from February, the, uh, written by Justice Alito, was leaked. It's widely believed this is a pro-abortion justice or a clerk who has re- released, leaked uh, this decision. This is not the final decision. So we are all holding our breath right now, praying that this is in fact the final decision that the court still has five votes to reverse Roe versus Wade and that this was just an act a desperate act from the abortion industry trying to gin up public support, protests across the country in an attempt to basically use a heckler's veto to bully to bully the five Supreme Court members uh, into changing their mind, Um, which, by the way, if you're on the Supreme Court and you allow uh, protesters to change your mind about what is or is not in the Constitution, you probably don't deserve to be on the Supreme Court in the first place. So we are impatiently waiting for the Supreme Court uh, to release uh, what would be the final decision. This is not final. Let me re say this again. This is not final. This is why, you know, you'll hear the pro-life movement uh, say, you know, if this is final, we pray it is final. This is a draft decision. We do not know yet. This is unprecedented in the history of the United States of America. In the history of the Supreme Court, this has never happened before. In fact, uh, there's many people on the left and the right who are actually more upset about the leak than I think they are about Roe being reversed, um, calling it this the greatest sin that could have ever happened for this leak to have to be uh, this leak from the Supreme Court, which I would say back up the train here. The greatest sin was allowing abortion in the first place. But it, this is a this is a, tr- a transformational moment and not for the good uh, of our country and forever. The way the Supreme Court uh, functions as an independent judiciary will always be altered. And let's be clear, the U.S. Senate and the pro-abortion U.S. senators wasted absolutely zero time uh, then after the Supreme Court has essentially been blown up um, to then say we should blow up the U.S. Senate and we should get rid of the filibuster and we need to pass the Women's Health Endangerment Act immediately to codify Roe versus Wade, uh, abortion all nine months of pregnancy for whatever reason, funded by taxpayers, into law. So there's a lot going on, but today specifically, I'm coming to you because I want to help you answer some of the pro-abortion talking points that you're hearing. Last week, Planned Parenthood actually announced they were launching a $16 million campaign in kind of like conservative red states to gin up support for abortion. Because I think what they're seeing is life has continued on in Texas. I'm in Texas right now filming this, you know, i traveling throughout Texas. I'm in the airport and, you know, there's women in business suits on cell phones conducting business. And guess what? Women are still graduating from college this weekend. And there's been absolutely um, no difference between now and September 1st when the Texas heartbeat law was signed into effect, which bans over over 60% of abortions in Texas. Life continues on. In fact, I would think this would be a big victory of feminism to say that, wow, 
No woman ever should have to feel like she has to choose abortion in order to continue on in her career, or continue advancing her career, or to achieve her educational goals. This is great. Women don't have to choose to end the life of a unique, whole living human being in order to be successful. But don't worry, the, the feminist movement uh, isn't that advanced yet. So let's go over some of these talking points. And I'm going to do this. Um, I'm trying to do this as fast as possible because as you can imagine, my phone has been blowing up. Um, okay. The first thing you're going to be hearing is that a majority of people support Roe versus Wade. They already see it. And last night I had this panel with pro-lifers on it who supported Roe versus Wade, not pro-lifers, um, you know, saying this, this is the talking point they're going to be using. Students for Life, for the past three or four years, we have done our own polling of millennials and Gen Z. Uh, that is the largest demographic in our electorate. A third of our electorate are 35 and under very scary for lots of other issues, but we really wanted to find out the, our target audience, how they feel about abortion. This January, our Dimitri Institute for Pro-Life Advancement, we actually released the polling results. You can go to Institute for Pro-Life Advancement.org and read the one pager um, of the polling results. You can see the questions we asked. We don't hide things like the you know pro-abortion pro -abortion pollsters do. Because what you often find in abortion polling is folks will say, do you support Roe versus Wade? Yes or no. If you ask that question, majority will say they support Roe versus Wade because it's they've heard the talking points. They don't fully understand abortion. They don't understand what Roe versus Wade is. They just think it means, you know, should women have equal rights to men? Honest to goodness, this is how majority of people view Roe versus Wade. So when you hear people say, oh, majority of, of Americans support Roe. You need to back up the train and you need to say, did those people who were polled know what Roe versus Wade was? Were they actually told what Roe versus Wade is? Sometimes you will see in polling, uh, the pollsters will kind of be a little tricky. They'll say Roe versus Wade allowed abortion in the first trimester. Do you support Roe versus Wade? That's technically true. What they failed to mention is Doe versus Bolton, the companion case that was issued on the same day, allows abortion in all nine months. And those two decisions go together. So it's very tricky when you when you talk about pollsters and this issue. So our research that we conducted this year with the most liberal voting block in uh, America, the mo the largest voting block in America as well, we found the majority, almost six out of ten, said they disagreed with Roe versus Wade. Once we told them this simple fact: Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton allow for abortion in all nine months of pregnancy for any reason, and sometimes with taxpayer funds. Once you say that line, more than almost six out of 10, nearly 60% of the most liberal voting bloc, the largest voting bloc in America, disagrees with Roe. So it is not correct to say the majority of Americans support Roe versus Wade. Other polling we can see when, when the Americans are told in nearly eight out of 10 oppose, of all ages, oppose Roe versus Wade, if they know what Roe is. So that is the first thing you've got to clarify when you're hearing this. The second thing you're going to hear lots of is what about the back alley? You know, women are going to be dying of illegal abortions in back alleys. This is going to be catastrophic. One, as I mentioned, I'm in Texas. I've actually had to be in some alleys in Houston and Dallas over the past month. And guess what? I've been shocked to find out there aren't any dead women in back alleys in Texas. Because the sad fact is, if she is determined to have an abortion, absolutely determined to have an abortion, she can still have an abortion. She can have an abortion before the child's heart begins to beat, or she can go to Oklahoma, she can go to other states, and she can still get an abortion and end the life of her child. There are options for women who still are desperate to kill, the, to kill their children. So I would say uh, that's not true. And Texas has proved this is not true. But I don't want you to just have to trust me, a pro-life leader, and you know, my what I've seen on the ground here in Texas, the state that's banned 60% of abortion. I'm actually going to read to you from the abortion industry themselves because I think that sometimes helps. So where did we get, first of all, where did we get the myth of tens of thousands of women dying at back alley abortions in the late 60s? This was a myth that was used to promote the legalization of abortion by two men, Bernard Nathanson and Larry Ladder, who co-founded NARAL, the National Association of Repeal of Abortion Laws. These two men wanted abortion to be legal throughout the country. Bernard Nathanson was committing legal abortions in New York State. Larry Ladder was the biographer of Margaret Sanger and actually had a falling out with Sanger because he was a, such a supporter of abortion and he believed that there was going to be a pending population bomb in the 1970s and he thought that abortion was a great solution to world overpopulation, which, by the way, never happened. 
So these two men met with Betty Friedan, convinced Betty Friedan to include abortion in the second edition of Feminist Mystique, and made up this myth. Bernard Nathanson later in life became a pro-life advocate and actually admitted to the fact that they made up this myth. But once again, why should you trust Bernard Nathanson? Because he became pro-life. Let's go back even further to the abortion industry. So 1974, Planned Parenthood awarded their highest honor to a man named Christopher Teets. Actually, it was he and his wife. These are This is Planned Parenthood's award-winning statistician. This guy is a statistician. The Washington Post, I actually found this in the Washington Post of all places. They actually found Christopher Teets' own writings about abortion mortality before 1973 and then after 1973. And once again, he won Planned Parenthood's highest award, the Maggie Award, which is that award named after Margaret Sanger, you know, the eugenicist who believed that certain races and certain classes of people shouldn't be able to reproduce. That's the same award they gave Nancy Pelosi and a whole bunch of other pro-abortion uh, leaders who then even after, you know, everybody told them that Margaret Sanger was a racist. You know, Nancy Pelosi refused to give up and return her Maggie Ward. But okay, I'll just stop there. So the Washington Post found a 1948 paper from Christopher Teets. 1948. Who wrote that the number of deaths from abortion was rapidly declining because of the invention of what? Penicillin and other drugs to fight infection. 1948, <clears throat> Teets writes publicly that the number of abortion deaths was rapidly declining because of, of, of penicillin. 1959, uh, Mary Calderon, who at that time is the National Medical Director of Planned Parenthood, she goes on to found CECUS, which is basically um, the reason for all the terrible comprehensive sex ed in schools. Uh, Mary Calderon, though, 1959, she's the medical director, National Medical Director of Planned Parenthood. Uh, she wrote, quote, abortion is no longer a dangerous procedure. In 1957, there were only 260 deaths in the whole country attributed to abortions of any kind. Mary Calderon then went on to say she attributed this decline to antibiotics, just what Christopher Teets had said, and the fact that 90% of illegal abortions, she believed at, in 1959, she's saying 90% of illegal abortions were being committed by trained physicians who she labeled are in good standing in their community. So 1959, medical director of Planned Parenthood saying 90% of abortions aren't being done in the back alley. They're being, conduct they're being conducted by physicians in good standing, meaning they see patients during the day, they're well-known in their communities, and they just don't advertise that they commit abortion, which actually makes sense because if you think about 1973, January 22nd, January 23rd comes around, there wasn't like an instant national abortion training protocol, right? People who were committing abortions on January 21st and January 22nd silently and quietly just were able to advertise it. 1969, Teets, Christopher Teets, I'm bringing him up again, he writes again publicly. So 1969, Christopher Teets, Planned Parenthood's own award-winning statistician, writes, quote, some 30 years ago it was judged that the such deaths might number five to 10,000 per year. But this rate, even was approximately correct at the time, it wasn't, cannot be anywhere near the true rate now. The total number of deaths from all causes among women of reproductive age, remember this is 1969, in the U.S. is not more than 50,000 per year. The National Center for Health Statistics listed 235 deaths from abortion in 1965. Total mortality from illegal abortions was undoubtedly larger than the figure, but in all likelihood it was under 1,000. So this is Planned Parenthood's own award-winning statistician in 1969 saying, yeah, it was somewhere between 200 and 1,000 women were dying of illegal abortions. By the way, the CDC in 1974 released their statistics, which, by the way, we don't have a national abortion reporting law, so we don't know how many women are injured from legal or illegal abortions. Uh, we don't know really the true side effects of abortion in our country. But in 1974, the CDC's own uh, estimation, they said that more women died from legal abortions than illegal abortions, because as we all know as pro-life advocates, abortion's not safe, even if it's legal. Abortion is not safe, even if it's legal. Okay, so I've addressed, let's see, I've addressed some of the polling. I've addressed the back alley abortion myth. Uh, the other last part I want to talk about is her body. Um, and this can be rebutted using science. No, uh, the child growing with inside of her is not part of a woman's body. Yes, the child is using uh, her body. 
Uh, and it depends, is dependent on her body to continue to grow and thrive. But the child is completely self-directed. What I, what's so cool is even when the child, so when the child comes into existence, when sperm and egg unite, a unique whole living human being that's never existed before and will never exist again is created, that child directs his or her own growth. The mother's body doesn't tell the child how to grow. In fact, the child directs the growth of the placenta, the organ that is developed, that is developed uh, and it was grown inside of the mother's womb that sustains the child's own life. It's unbelievable. So biologically, no, the child inside of a woman's body is not her body. When I was pregnant with my boys, my three sons, I did not suddenly become a man because I had male genitalia. No, my children had male genitalia, but I was still very much a woman. Which, by the way, I'm very interested in the fact that everyone is now talking about women and we all suddenly know what women really are uh, <laughs> with this Supreme Court case. So, no, biologically, the child is not part of the woman's body. It is true. The child relies on the mother's body for support and for safekeeping. That is absolutely true. Um, I saw uh, Kirsten Powers on CNN last night in this you know, panel that had supposed pro-lifers on it talking about, this isn't about abortion. This is about women's rights to be free. And aren't women full human beings? Absolutely. The fundamental premise of our, of our movement in the, in the pro-life movement is that every human being, born, pre-born, male, female, has equal deserving rights to life. So we, this, this um, argument, this movement to make abortion unthinkable, to make abortion unavailable is not an argument, is not a movement to deny women their humanity. No, we, we are seeking to expand and to ensure that every member of our human species is acknowledged as a member of our human species and treated, treated as such. And there's a reason why our founders wrote life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in that order, because every time pursuit of happiness or liberty trumps another person's right to life, the, the result is always the same death, subjugation, destruction. That's always happened. You can look at, um, look at slavery. Slavery is a perfect example of that. When someone else's pursuit of happiness, pursuit of wealth trumped another person's right to life, look what happened. And this is exactly what we see in abortion today. It's, you know, this is my body and this, you know, having, you know, enduring nine months of pregnancy will change my body is a, is a, is a challenge, is a burden for me. Therefore, I should have the right to end the life of my child. Our movement would say, no, you've engaged in a behavior, unless you're talking about an, uh, terrible circumstances of sexual assault, you have engaged in a behavior that you know could lead to the creation of a unique whole human life. And there are consequences to every decision and every choice that we make. And, and heterosexual sex has interesting consequences. And the creation of a unique whole living human life is one of those. And you've essentially consented when you engage in that heterosexual sex, you've consented to the fact that you acknowledge, you acknowledge that this could be a potential consequence of, the, of your behavior. And you've essentially given that permission over for that life to be created. Abortion isn't fundamentally like just denying that abortion is saying I've given permission and I'm taking it away. I'm taking it away. You will hear this. I've been hearing this on campuses. This is the, the old analogy of, um, uh, the society of music lovers kidnaps you. You're walking the street, you get kidnapped, you wake up, you're in a hospital bed, you're plugged in to the guy next to you. And the society of music lovers is like, yeah, sorry, we had to kidnap you. It kind of sucks, but it turns out this world famous violence is going to die. You're the only person alive in the world, uh, alive in the world that can keep him alive. And your body has to be hooked up to his to sustain his life. But don't worry. After nine months, he's going to get all better. You can get unhooked. And uh, abortion advocates use this to try to like try to trick pro-lifers. Um, <clears throat> but what they're what they're missing in this analogy is you as an individual, <clears throat> it would be very nice of you, even though this unjust action has happened to you, that you've been kidnapped, you've been plugged into another human being that you don't even know that you have no relationship with against your will. It would be a really nice thing uh, <laughs> for you to say, you know what, you've done wrong, um, but um, I'm going to stay plugged into you. But your, your moral obligation to a stranger is fundamentally different 
uh, than your obligation to offspring, to a life that you've created, that you participated in the creation of a life. Um, the second uh, thing you have to remember with, with this analogy and when the abortion supporters try to compare it with abortion is what I talked about earlier of um, sustaining and actively denying. denying. So with abortion, it's not just, oh, you're re removing support. You are actively going in and dismembering and violently ending another human being. Uh, that is that is fundamentally different than simply saying, <clears throat> I'm not going to support uh, that human being any longer. Because in order to, in a pregnancy not to support a human being that's growing with inside of you, you have to commit an act of violence and you actually have to 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 dismember that child or cause a heart attack or rip them apart through a suction catheter. So it's fundamentally, it's fundamentally different. So. All right. Sorry, guys. Tried to keep this short. I know there's a lot to unpack. There's going to be more podcasts coming. Make sure you subscribe to my Twitter feed, uh, Kristen Hawkins, uh, and my Instagram, and as well as Students for Life. We'll be keeping you up to date. We're at the court today. We're going to be on the ground every single day giving you up to the minute news. Um, but I would encourage all of you today to stop pray for the five justices, uh, pray for their safety, pray for their courage, um, reflect upon what you need to do in your community to make sure no woman stands alone in a post row America. What resources does she need? What resources do you have in place that she probably doesn't know about? Hint, she probably doesn't know about them and then get busy acting, whether it's combating the lies on social media, whether it's talking to your neighbors and friends, whether it's starting a pro-life group, uh, whether it's joining Students for Life Action and getting involved in primaries and making sure that we only elect, you know, candidates, especially Republicans, who are actually going to be pro-life because all this is coming back down to the states. Uh, and let us pray uh, that this this moment. This moment happens and we become the first post road generation. Um, if it if it happens, just so you know, I was doing some math last night, just quick math. Uh, we think with about the 26 states that will act and ban abortion, um, about 50 kindergarten rooms will be saved a day. Immediately, 50 kindergarten rooms will be saved a day from from the violence of abortion. So there's a lot online. Bye, guys. Bye.